Hi guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at the operating systems and the computer architecture. In today's video we're going to look at what are operating systems, what are interrupts and buffers. We're going to look at the computer architecture and the von Neumann computer model. And finally we will finish by looking at this uh, search execute, uh, execute cycle. <laughs> uh, a bit um, hard to pronounce there but uh, fetch execute cycle there you go okay so uh, here we have a textbook I'm gonna be linking the PDF towards this you can read it at your own time so basically I'm gonna be going through this okay so let's begin I'm gonna have my pen tool outside and I'm gonna be reading through it with you guys okay so this introduction we need to know about this is that all modern computers have uh, an operating system okay so that's just part of how a computer is built now the computer systems uh, which have the operating systems helps us communicate with the software and hardware. Okay, so when we look at how a computer is made, we know that a computer is made up with uh, software and hardware. Okay, software is the ones that are inside the computer that allow us to do those tasks and hardware is uh, physical components that make up a computer. So keeping that in mind, um, we use the von Neumann model to um, this uh, or like maybe uh, all of this is computer architecture and basically the common ones are called the von Neumann model okay that's just a type of model that is used to build a computer okay and this is called a computer architecture so today in this chapter we're going to look at how everything works behind the system so we start with the operating system okay what is the operating system now, an operating system is essentially a software keep in mind that it is a software not a hardware it's not a component but instead it is a software running in the background of a computer system so in simple words an operating system is basically a software that runs in the background of the computer system and manages many basic functions okay now an operating system does many functions okay and um, these are all small basic small tasks that help a computer uh, throughout its running okay and this is all in the background it's not shown uh, because of course it's a software all softwares you know i mean they are the reason why computers work okay so obviously not all operating systems carry out everything shown in this figure that's below uh, but these are just some tasks the operating system does now some of the more important tasks would be uh, security which is always necessary when opening um, your computer and input and output control later on we will make a video on input and output and you will see how uh, important it is when dealing with computers also the interface without the interface the computer will not be able to work so then we have memory management, processor management, uh, we look at error handling, batch processing, multi-programming, multitasking. So these are just all of the small tasks carried out by the operating system. Okay, small tasks that you do in the computer system is actually um, helped or actually is done by the operating system. So let's give some examples of an operating system and you guys will all know about Windows. Okay, Windows is a very popular operating system and I'm actually currently using the operating uh, system Windows. So this is one of the most popular operating systems and this Windows does all of these tasks that you see above. Some other examples would be Linux, Android, Unix and DOS. Okay. Then Windows is an example of a single user multitasking operating system. What does it mean by a single user multitasking operating system? Basically, this means that uh, only one user can use the computer at a time, but you can have many applications open. Okay, like right now, maybe I can have um, a different tabs open, different applications open, but it's only one user, only at one time. So when a computer is first powered up, um, the programs are loaded into the memory from the read-only memory chip. And these programs then run a checking procedure to make sure the hardware processor, internal memory, and the BIOS, which is basic input output system, are all functioning correctly. 
if there are no errors detected, then the operating system is loaded into the memory. So it's basically like a cycle. So the computer first looks at the hardware, the processor, the internal memory, and then the BIOS, and then finally can look at the operating system. Also, you need to know that simple devices with embedded microprocessors, are not all of them have operating systems. It's not a must for a device that uh, you know does these small tasks have operating system, but it is most common in computers. Okay. So here, it just gives some examples such as uh, cookers, microwave oven, ovens, uh, washing machines only carry out single tasks, which don't vary. The input is usually a button pressed on the touch screen option and basically activates the hardware function. You don't need the operating system to do anything on that. It's a very simple process. Therefore, you don't need operating system. So after getting to know more about operating system and the, you know, the tasks carried out by that, we now need to look at the interrupts and buffers. An interrupt is a single a signal sent from a device or from the software to the processor okay so this is a signal sent from the device or from the software to the processor okay what is this signal we're going to look at this now so this will cause the processor to temporarily stop what it is doing and service the interrupt an interrupt can occur when number one the disk drive is ready to receive more data so you can get a signal when the disk drive is ready to receive more data. You can also get a signal when there is an error occurred, like a paper jam in a printer. You can also get one if the user has pressed a key to interrupt the current process, okay, such as control alt break. The next one is a software error has occurred. An example of this sound, uh, I mean, sorry, if this would be an exe file, okay, so this is when there is a software error. So usually you have errors that could be like paper jams. You could also have software errors and then you could also have different interrupts. So simply an interrupt is basically a signal sent to the device. The processor stops everything it's doing currently for temporary purposes. It goes, fixes that issue by maybe displaying a message uh, or it tries to stop the service and then it gets back to what it's doing. So these interrupts allow computers to carry out many tasks, okay, or have several windows open at the same time. Now, an example would be downloading a file from the internet, okay, or listening to some music from the computer library. Whenever an interrupt is serviced, the status of the current task being run is saved, okay. So if I'm watching a movie, listening to music, there's an error in my music app okay i will get a uh, interrupt or the interrupt will send a signal to the device and the processor will stop everything it's doing and save it okay it will save and then it will try fix the problem and then resume what it was doing okay so what is the saving done the saving is done by the interrupt handler okay and once the interrupt has fully been serviced okay once when it's been fixed then it continues from the point it stopped. After looking at interrupts, we need to know now know about buffers. Okay, what are buffers? Okay, buffers are used in computers as a temporary memory area. Okay, these are essential in modern computers since hardware devices operate at a much slower speed than the processor. Okay, so buffers basically is a temporary memory area. Okay. If there was no buffers, then processors would spend the majority of their time idle, waiting for the hardware device to complete its operations. So basically, buffers are essentially filled from the processor or memory unit, and whilst they are emptied to the hardware device, the processor carries on with the other tasks. Buffers are used, for example, when streaming a video from the internet. It ensures that the video playback does not keep stopping to wait for data from the internet. Okay, so it keeps saving it, keep saving it. So there's a, uh, there's basically a flow. Okay, so it keeps saving it because it doesn't want to be idle. The processor shouldn't be idle, and therefore it uses buffers to temporarily store the data. So when you need the data, it is being played out. For example, along the movie, and sometimes you see um, the the movie pauses suddenly. That means 
that uh, there was nothing in the buffer. The processor had nothing to display. No data was there. Now, buffers and interrupts work together to allow these standard computer to, uh, functions to be carried out. And therefore, it's important to know about buffers and interrupts. So here we have a diagram of how a buffer, and, uh, a buffer and interrupt works. So you can see this is when you send uh, data to a printer. Okay, we are going to move on and look at the computer architecture. So very early computers were fed with data whilst the machines were actually running. They weren't able to store programs. Consequently, they weren't able to run without human intervention. And therefore came in 1945 when John von Neumann developed the idea of a stored program computer. And this was referred to his name, the von Neumann architecture concept. This basically was an idea on holding the programs and data in memory. Sorry about that. And data in a memory. So this is basically the storing. Data would then move between the memory unit and the processor. So here's a diagram of how the Van Neumann architecture looks, okay? And you can see here is the processor, the memory unit, the input and output, and you have your uh, IO device and IO device. So you can see the processor and the memory unit work together. Also, the processor sends signals here and also sends signals to the input and output. The memory unit sends to the input and finally the processor and memory unit also send here. So if you can see that the control unit is the reason, okay, all of this is happening. It's, it's, it's main like the, the main sort of, um, the main sort of device in the von Neumann uh, data because if you can see that it's used in every task carried out it's the sending in the memory unit the input output device and all of that um, now as you guys can see there's a key here with different colors so you can see purple is the address bus the green one is the data bus and the peach one is the control bus we'll look at what are these buses mean and basically, they are looking at how data is moved around the von Neumann um, architecture. So what is the address bus? We're going to look at address bus. The address bus carries signals related to addresses. Okay, just comes from, it comes from its name, address bus, so therefore carries signals relating to addresses, okay, between the processor and the memory. Okay, then we have the data bus, which sends data between the processor, the memory unit, and the input-output devices. Finally, we have the control bus, which carries signals relating to the control and coordination of all activities within the computer, um, and all of this is needed. Okay, so all of this basically collects data and sends data. So the address bus signals relating to addresses, the data bus sends data between the processor, memory unit, and the input devices, and the control bus carries signals relating to the control and coordination of all these activities. So here is a more detailed diagram where you have the memory units here, the MAR, the MDR. We have the processor in between. This is the automatic logic unit, ALU. We have the output devices, the input devices, and finally we have the control unit. So an address is the location of where data can be found in a computer memory. Each address in the memory is unique, and the addresses are actually shown in figure 4.4. So they're not shown here, but they are contained in the diagram. Okay, so the function of these addresses, um, as you can see, were all of these um, stated points uh, carrying signals uh, around the architecture structure outside. So all these data must be represented in the register before it can be processed. We looked at what registers are before. Uh, if you watched my previous video on binary, we actually used binary values in registers. We then come to the memory units. And when we look at memory units, we say that it is made up of number of partitions. Okay, that each partition consists of an address and its contents. Okay, so here is how uh, an address is unique, okay? It has a different address and a different content. 
Now, as you can see in the previous model, we had stuff like the MAR, the MDR, the ALU, the PC, the CIR. What are all of these values? Now, the MAR is the memory address register. The MDR is the memory data register. The ALU, as I said, is the automatic and logic unit. The PC is the program counter and the CIR is the current instruction register. Okay, so uh, keeping that in mind, here is just some more, uh, this is actually a binary value, uh, giving some more properties about addresses, uh, but we will move on. Um, uh, but you guys can read this, you can pause the video and read it. But it's not that important, um, but simply you need to know that addresses are unique and one of the properties of a register is actually binary values. Now let's say you need to describe the von Neumann diagram, okay, and the examiner asks you to describe this. Okay, what would you say? Now initially you would say the processor contains the automatic and logic units, okay? The ALU allows the automatic and logic operations to be carried out. The control unit basically controls the operations of the memory, processor, and input output devices. It contains the current instructions, register, and the program count. The CIR contains the current instructions during the processing, and the PC contains the address of the next instruction to be executed. So here are basically just some rules of the processor and the control unit. And then, of course, we know the input and output devices. Uh, we've been uh, doing this for so long, so you must be knowing about the input and output devices. But if you're not aware about the input and output devices, simply an input is basically entering data and output is when you are receiving the data. In simple terms, all you need to know is that. But now maybe we have to explain the fetch execute cycle. Okay, what is the fetch execute cycle? And basically, these are instructions that need to be decoded before finally being executed. Okay, so we have some uh, data that must be decoded and then executed, and we call this the fetch execute cycle. Fetch. When we look at fetch, we look at in the fetch execute cycle, the next instruction is fetched from the memory address, which is stored in the PC, and is then stored in the CIR. Okay, so this is where they get their data from the um, memory address, and they execute it. Um, when you decode the instruction as a set of control signals. So here are just some stages, you can go over them. The program counter contains the address of the memory location, uh, so on, so forth. Okay, so there you go guys, that was all about the computer architecture. I hope you enjoyed this video, we went through the entire chapter, and I'll see you in my next video. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.